Chapter 9. Islam. Spread by the sword? You bet. Guess what? What is known today as the Islamic world was created by a series of brutal conquests of non-Muslim lands. These were wars of religious imperialism, not self-defense. The early spread of Islam and that of Christianity sharply contrast in that Islam spread by force, and Christianity didn't. Virtually all Westerners have learned to apologize for the Crusades, but less noted is the fact that the Crusades have an Islamic counterpart for which no one is apologizing, and of which few are even aware. The first large-scale contact of Muslims with the Western world came not with the Crusades, but 450 years before them. When the forces of Islam united the scattered tribes of Arabia into a single community, the newly Islamic Arabia was surrounded by predominantly Christian lands, notably the Byzantine imperial holdings of Syria and Egypt, as well as the venerable Christian lands of North Africa. Four of Christendom's five principal cities, Constantinople, Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem, lay within striking distance of Arabia. The Byzantine Empire's great rival, Persia, also had a significant Christian population. But for centuries now, the Middle East, North Africa, and Persia, Iran, have been regarded as the heart of the Islamic world. Did this transformation take place through preaching and the conversion of hearts and minds? Not at all. The sword spread Islam. Under Islamic rule, the non-Muslim majorities of those regions were gradually whittled down to the tiny minorities they are today through repression, discrimination, and harassment that made conversion to Islam the only path to a better life. PC Myth Early Muslims had no bellicose designs on neighboring lands. Toward the end of Muhammad's life, after his successful expedition against the pagan Hawazin and the Taqif tribes, whom he defeated at Hunain, a valley near Mecca, he attempted to move beyond Arabia, beginning an expedition against the Byzantines in Tabuk. He also contacted the Byzantine emperor Heraclius and other rulers in the region by letter. The prophet of Allah wrote to Khazroes, king of Persia, Caesar, emperor of Rome, that is, Heraclius, Nagus, king of Abyssinia, and every other despot inviting them to Allah, the exalted, he exhorted them to embrace Islam, and you will be safe. None did, and Muhammad's warning proved accurate. None of them were safe. Not long after Muhammad's death, the Muslims invaded the Byzantine Empire, fired up by Muhammad's promise that the first army amongst my followers who will invade Caesar's city, Constantinople, will be forgiven their sins. In 635, just three years after Muhammad died, Damascus, the city where St. Paul was heading when he experienced his dramatic conversion to Christianity, fell to the invading Muslims. In 636, the Caliph Umar, who ruled and expanded the empire of Islam from 634 to 644, took al-Basra in Iraq. Umar gave instructions to his lieutenant, Utba ibn Ghazwan, in words that echoed the Prophet Muhammad's triple choice for unbelievers. Summon the people to God. Those who respond to your call, accept it from them. But those who refuse must pay the poll tax out of humiliation and lowliness. If they refuse this, it is the sword, without leniency. Fear God with regard to what you have been entrusted." Antioch, where the disciples of Jesus were first called Christians, Acts chapter 11 verse 26, fell the next year. It was Jerusalem's turn two years later, in 638. Like Damascus and Antioch, Jerusalem was a Christian city at that time. It was the unhappy task of Sophronius, the patriarch of Jerusalem, to hand over the city to the conquering Umar. The caliph stood happily on the site of Solomon's temple, from which he may have believed that the prophet Muhammad, his old master, once ascended into paradise. See, for example, Quran, Surah 17, verse 1, 
a verse that has inspired centuries of debate as to its precise meaning. Sophronius, watching in deep sorrow nearby, recalled a Bible verse, Behold the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet. PC Myth The native Christians of the Middle East and North Africa welcomed Muslims as liberators. Many modern analysts of the Crusades and Christian-Muslim relations in general seem to think that Sophronius said, Welcome, liberator. According to conventional wisdom, Byzantine rule was so oppressive on the Christians in the Middle East and North Africa, and Egyptians in particular, that they couldn't wait to give them the bum's rush and open their arms to the Muslims who liberated them from this oppression. But in fact, the Muslims conquered and held Egypt only in the face of great resistance. In December 639, the general Amr began the invasion of Egypt. In November 642, Alexandria fell, and virtually all of Egypt was in Muslim hands. But this swift conquest was not uncontested, and the Muslims met resistance with brutality. In one Egyptian town they set a pattern of behavior that they followed all over the country. According to a contemporary observer, Then the Muslims arrived in Nikyu. There was not one single soldier to resist them. They seized the town and slaughtered everyone they met in the street and in the churches, men, women, and children, sparing nobody. Then they went to other places, pillaged and killed all the inhabitants they found. But let us now say no more, for it is impossible to describe the horrors the Muslims committed when they occupied the island of Nikiu. Not only were many native Christians killed, others were enslaved. Amr oppressed Egypt. He took considerable booty from this country and a large number of prisoners. The Muslims returned to their country with booty and captives. The patriarch Cyrus felt deep grief at the calamities in Egypt, because Amr, who was of barbarian origin, showed no mercy in his treatment of the Egyptians, and did not fulfill the covenants which had been agreed with him. Christian Armenia also fell to the Muslims, amid similar butcheries. The enemy's army rushed in and butchered the inhabitants of the town by the sword. After a few days' rest, the Ismailites, Arabs, went back whence they had come, dragging after them a host of captives, numbering thirty-five thousand. The same pattern prevailed when the Muslims reached Cilicia and Caesarea of Cappadocia in 650. According to a medieval account, they, the Tayai, or Muslim Arabs, moved into Cilicia and took prisoners. And when Muawiyah arrived, he ordered all the inhabitants to be put to the sword. He placed guards so that no one escaped. After gathering up all the wealth of the town, they set to torturing the leaders to make them show them things, treasures that had been hidden. The Tayai led everyone into slavery, men and women, boys and girls, and they committed much debauchery in that unfortunate town. They wickedly committed immoralities inside churches. Caliph Umar made a telling admission in a message to an underling. Do you think, he asked, that these vast countries, Syria, Mesopotamia, Kufa, Basra, Misr, Egypt, do not have to be covered with troops who must be well paid? Why did these areas have to be covered with troops if the inhabitants welcomed the invaders and lived with them in friendship? Muhammad versus Jesus. All who take the sword will perish by the sword. Jesus. Matthew, chapter 26, verse 52. Know that paradise is under the shades of swords. Jihad in Allah's cause. PC Myth. Early jihad warriors were merely defending Muslim lands from their non-Muslim neighbors. The Muslim armies swept quickly over huge regions that had never threatened them, and probably hadn't even heard of them until the invaders arrived. Around the same time Egypt, the Middle East, and Armenia were falling to the Muslims, Europe was not exempt. Other Muslim forces carried out raids on Cyprus, Rhodes, Crete, and Sicily. They carried off booty and thousands of slaves. 
These were but preludes to the first great Muslim sieges of what was then the grandest city of eastern Christendom and one of the greatest in the world, Constantinople. Muslim armies laid siege in 668 and for several years thereafter and 717. Both sieges failed, but they made it abundantly clear that the House of Islam was continuing its policy of bloody imperialism toward Christendom. Muslim warriors did all this in obedience to the commands of their God and his prophet. One Muslim leader of that era put it this way, The great God says in the Koran, O true believers, when you encounter the unbelievers, strike off their heads. The above command of the great God is a great command and must be respected and followed. He was referring, of course, to the Koran. When you meet the unbelievers in the battlefield, strike off their heads, and when you have laid them low, bind your captives firmly. Surah 47, verse 4. French President Jacques Chirac has remarked, Europe owes as much to Islam as it does to Christianity. But this is like saying that the hen owes as much to the fox as it does to Farmer John. For Europe in the 8th century would soon know just how seriously the Muslims took the commands of Allah about meeting the unbelievers on the battlefield. The Muslims swept rapidly through Christian North Africa, and by 711 they were in a position to invade Spain. Christian Europe was beset from both the East and the West. The campaign went well. So well, in fact, that the Muslim commander, Tariq, exceeded his orders and pressed his victorious army forward. When he was upbraided by the North African emir, Musa, and asked why he had kept going so far into Christian Spain in defiance of orders, Tariq replied simply, To serve Islam. He served it so well that by 715 the Muslims were close to conquering all of Spain, which they held, of course, for over 700 years, and began to press into France. Charles Martel, the hammer, stopped them in 732 at the city of Tours. Despite this defeat, the Muslims didn't give up. In 792, the ruler of Muslim Spain, Hisham, called for a new expedition into France. Muslims around the world enthusiastically responded to his call to jihad, and the army that gathered was able to do a good deal of damage, but ultimately did not prevail. Nonetheless, it is important to note that Hisham's call was religiously based, and that it antedates the Crusades, which are supposed to mark the beginning of Christian-Muslim hostility, by just over three hundred years. Some fifty years later, in 848, another Muslim army invaded France and wreaked considerable havoc. But over time, their fervor faded. In the course of the Muslim occupation, many of the occupiers were converted to Christianity, and the force dissipated. Somewhat earlier, in 827, the warriors of jihad set their sights on Sicily and Italy. The commander of the invading force was a noted scholar of the Quran, who forthrightly cast the expedition as a religious war. They pillaged and looted Christian churches all through these lands, terrorizing monks and violating nuns. By 846 they had reached Rome, where they exacted a promise of tribute from the Pope. While their hold on Italy was never strong, they held Sicily until 1091, when the Normans drove them out. In Spain, of course, the Reconquista began to slowly chip away at Muslim domains, until 1492, when the Christians had entirely recaptured the nation. However, as battles raged in Spain, the Muslims continued to press Christendom's eastern flank. The Seljuk Turks decisively defeated the forces of the Byzantine Empire at the Armenian town of Manzikert in 1071, paving the way for the Muslim occupation of virtually all of Asia Minor, some of the central and most well-known lands of Christendom. Henceforth, Christians would suffer second-class dhimmi status in the great Christian cities to which Paul addressed many of his canonical epistles. It is against the backdrop of all this, as we shall see, that Pope Urban II called the First Crusade in 1095. Just like today, Islam must be spread by force. 
Some of the modern-day Islamic thinkers who are most revered today by jihad terrorists taught, in no uncertain terms, that Islam must impose itself by force upon non-Muslims, not as a religion, for that would violate the Quran's dictum that there is no compulsion in religion, Quran, Surah 2, verse 256, but as a system of laws and societal norms. They taught that Muslims must fight to impose Islamic law on non-Muslim states, relegating its citizens to dhimmi status or worse. Not only West, but East. Muslim forces pressed eastward as well as westward, mounting a sea invasion of India as early as 634. Land invaders pressed into what are now Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India beginning in the 8th century, making slow but steady progress. Historian Sita Ram Gol observes that by 1206, the Muslim invaders had conquered the Punjab, Sindh, Delhi, and the Doab up to Kanauj. Later waves expanded these holdings to the Ganges and beyond. Because Muslims considered the Hindu pagans who weren't even entitled to the protections of dhimmi status, they treated them with particular brutality. Sita Ram Gol observes that the Muslim invaders of India paid no respect to codes of warfare that had prevailed there for centuries. Islamic imperialism came with a different code, the Sunnah tradition of the Prophet. It required its warriors to fall upon the helpless civil population after a decisive victory had been won on the battlefield. It required them to sack and burn down villages and towns after the defenders had died fighting or had fled. The cows, the Brahmins, and the bhikshus invited their special attention in mass murders of non-combatants. The temples and monasteries were their special targets in an orgy of pillage and arson. Those whom they did not kill, they captured and sold as slaves. The magnitude of the booty looted even from the bodies of the dead was a measure of the success of the military mission. And they did all this as mujahids, holy warriors, and ghazis, kafir, unbeliever killers, in the service of Allah and his last prophet. What did the Muslims want? What was the ultimate goal of this seemingly endless warfare? It is clear from the commands of the Quran and the Prophet, who told his followers that Allah had commanded him to fight against the people until they testify that none has the right to be worshipped but Allah, and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. No Islamic sect has ever renounced the proposition that Islamic law must reign supreme over the entire world, and that Muslims must, under certain circumstances, take up arms to this end. They stopped waging large-scale jihads after 1683, not because they had reformed or rejected the doctrines that motivated them, but because the Islamic world had grown too weak to continue, a situation that began to change in recent times with the discovery of oil in the Middle East. The Egyptian Quran commentator and Muslim Brotherhood theorist Said Qutb, 1906-1966, emphasized this clearly. It is not the function of Islam to compromise with the concepts of jahiliya, the society of unbelievers, which are current in the world, or to coexist in the same land together with a jahili system. Islam cannot accept any mixing with jahiliya. Either Islam will remain, or jahiliya. No half-half situation is possible. Command belongs to Allah, or otherwise to jahiliya. Allah's Sharia, law, will prevail, or else people's desires. And if they do not respond to you, then know that they only follow their own lusts. And who is more astray than one who follows his own lusts, without guidance from Allah? Verily, Allah guides not the people who are disobedient. Quran, Surah 28, verse 50. The foremost duty of Islam is to depose Jahiliya from the leadership of man, with the intention of raising human beings to that high position which Allah has chosen for him. Likewise, Sayyid Abul Allah Maududi, 
1903 to 1979, founder of the Pakistani political party Jamaat e Islami, declared that non Muslims have absolutely no right to seize the reins of power in any part of God's earth, nor to direct the collective affairs of human beings according to their own misconceived doctrines. If they do, the believers would be under an obligation to do their utmost to dislodge them from political power and to make them live in subservience to the Islamic way of life. Do their utmost, even to the point of strapping on bombs and blowing themselves up in crowded buses or restaurants, or hijacking airplanes and flying them into office towers. PC Myth Christianity and Islam spread in pretty much the same way. This is one of many moral equivalence arguments made today. They're so common that it seems as if some people cannot bring themselves to acknowledge that there could be anything negative about Islam, unless they take pains to point out that the same negative thing exists in Christianity. And it's certainly true that no group, religious or unreligious, has a monopoly on either misdeeds or virtue. But it doesn't follow that all religious traditions are equal, either in the nature of their teachings or in the capacity of those teachings to inspire violence. For nearly the first three centuries of its existence, Christianity was outlawed and subject to sporadic persecution by Roman authorities. Not only was the religion not spread by violence, but the lists of Christian martyrs are filled with the names of people subjected to violence because they became Christians. In contrast, by the time of Muhammad's death, the Muslims faced no organized or sustained opposition, and yet continued to take up the sword for their faith. In the early days of Christianity, the church sent missionaries to preach to non-believers and convince them of the truth of their faith. The ancient Christian nations of Europe all remember the Christian missionaries who brought the faith to them, St. Patrick in Ireland, St. Augustine of Canterbury in England, St. Cyril and Methodius in Central and Eastern Europe, and others like them. They were priests and monks, not military men. Muslims, by contrast, put armies in the field that faced non-Muslim forces and offered them Muhammad's triple choice of conversion, subjugation, or death. They drew their largest numbers of converts from among conquered Dimi populations that saw the embrace of Islam as their only path to a livable existence. Given all the depredations of Dimitude, it is hardly surprising that many Dimis ultimately chose Islam. Today, many Muslims hotly deny that Islam spread by force, and point out that forced conversion is forbidden in Islam. That is absolutely true. What spread by force was the political and social hegemony of the Islamic system. Conversions to Islam followed the imposition of that system, as the dhimmis began to feel their misery. A Book You're Not Supposed to Read Jihad in the West, Muslim Conquests from the 7th to the 21st Centuries, by Paul Fregosi, New York, Prometheus Books, 1998, is a popular, highly readable account of the depredations of jihad in the Western world, and a vivid illustration of the posture of war that the Islamic world has maintained toward Christendom and the post-Christian West since its earliest days. Part 2. The Crusades Chapter 10. Why the Crusades were called Guess what? The Crusades were not acts of unprovoked aggression by Europe against the Islamic world, but were a delayed response to centuries of Muslim aggression, which grew fiercer than ever in the 11th century. These were wars for the recapture of Christian lands and the defense of Christians, not religious imperialism. The Crusades were not called in order to convert Muslims or anyone else to Christianity by force. The Crusaders' sack of Jerusalem in 1099, according to journalist Amin Malouf in The Crusades Through Arab Eyes, was the starting point of a millennial hostility between Islam and the West. Islamic scholar and apologist John Esposito is a bit more expansive. 
He blames the Crusades, so-called holy wars in general, for disrupting a pluralistic civilization. Five centuries of peaceful coexistence elapsed before political events and an imperial papal power play led to centuries-long series of so-called holy wars that pitted Christendom against Islam and left an enduring legacy of misunderstanding and distrust. Malouf doesn't seem to consider whether millennial hostility may have begun with the Prophet Muhammad's veiled threat, issued over 450 years before the Crusaders entered Jerusalem, to neighboring non-Muslim leaders, to embrace Islam and you will be safe. Nor does he discuss the possibility that Muslims may have stoked that millennial hostility by seizing Christian lands, which amounted to two-thirds of what had formerly been the Christian world, centuries before the Crusades. Esposito's five centuries of peaceful coexistence were exemplified, he says, by the Muslim conquest of Jerusalem in 638. Churches and the Christian population were left unmolested. But he doesn't mention Sophronius's Christmas sermon for 634, when he complained of the Muslims' savage, barbarous, and bloody sword, and of how difficult that sword had made life for the Christians. Muhammad versus Jesus Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus Matthew chapter 5 verses 8 through 10 Allah assigns for a person who participates in holy battles in Allah's cause, and nothing causes him to do so except belief in Allah and his messengers, that he will be recompensed by Allah either with a reward or booty, if he survives, or will be admitted to paradise, if he is killed in the battle as a martyr. PC Myth the Crusades were an unprovoked attack by Europe against the Islamic world. Wrong. The conquest of Jerusalem in 638 stood at the beginning of centuries of Muslim aggression, and Christians in the Holy Land faced an escalating spiral of persecution. A few examples. Early in the 8th century, 60 Christian pilgrims from Amorium were crucified. Around the same time, the Muslim governor of Caesarea seized a group of pilgrims from Iconium and had them all executed as spies, except for a small number who converted to Islam. And Muslims demanded money from pilgrims, threatening to ransack the Church of the Resurrection if they didn't pay. Later in the 8th century, a Muslim ruler banned displays of the cross in Jerusalem, he also increased the anti-religious tax, jizya, that Christians had to pay, and forbade Christians to engage in religious instruction of others, even their own children. Brutal subordination and violence became the rules of the day for Christians in the Holy Land. In 772, the Caliph al-Mansur ordered the hands of Christians and Jews in Jerusalem to be stamped with a distinctive symbol— Conversions to Christianity were dealt with particularly harshly. In 789, Muslims beheaded a monk who had converted from Islam and plundered the Bethlehem Monastery of St. Theodosius, killing many more monks. Other monasteries in the region suffered the same fate. Early in the ninth century, the persecutions grew so severe that large numbers of Christians fled to Constantinople and other Christian cities. More persecutions in 923 saw additional churches destroyed, and in 937 Muslims went on a Palm Sunday rampage in Jerusalem, plundering and destroying the Church of Calvary and the Church of the Resurrection. In reaction to this persecution of Christians, the Byzantines moved from a defensive policy toward the Muslims to the offensive position of trying to recapture some of their lost territories. In the 960s, General Nicephorus Phocas, a future Byzantine emperor, carried out a series of successful campaigns against the Muslims, recapturing Crete, Cilicia, Cyprus, and even parts of Syria. In 969, he recaptured the ancient Christian city of Antioch. 
The Byzantines extended this campaign into Syria in the 970s. In Islamic theology, if any land has ever belonged to the House of Islam, it belongs forever, and Muslims must wage war to regain control over it. In 974, faced with a string of losses to the Byzantines, the Abbasid, Sunni, Caliph in Baghdad declared jihad. This followed yearly jihad campaigns against the Byzantines launched by Saif al dawla ruler of the Shiite Hamdanid dynasty in Aleppo from 944 to 967. Saif al dawla appealed to Muslims to fight the Byzantines on the pretext that they were taking lands that belonged to the House of Islam. This appeal was so successful that Muslim warriors from as far off as Central Asia joined the jihads. However, Sunni Shiite disunity ultimately hampered Islamic jihad efforts, and in 1001 the Byzantine emperor, Basil II, concluded a ten-year truce with the Fatimid Shiite caliph. Basil, however, soon learned that to conclude such truces was futile. In 1004, the sixth Fatimid caliph, Abu Ali al-Mansur al-Hakim, 985-1021, to turned violently against the faith of his Christian mother and uncles, two of whom were patriarchs, ordering the destruction of churches, the burning of crosses, and the seizure of church property. He moved against the Jews with similar ferocity. Over the next ten years, 30,000 churches were destroyed, and untold numbers of Christians converted to Islam simply to save their lives. In 1009, al-Hakim gave his most spectacular anti-Christian order. He commanded that the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem be destroyed, along with several other churches, including the Church of the Resurrection. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre, rebuilt by the Byzantines in the 7th century after the Persians burned an earlier version, marks the traditional site of Christ's burial. It also served as a model for the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Al-Hakim commanded that the tomb within be cut down to the bedrock. He ordered Christians to wear heavy crosses around their necks, and for Jews, heavy blocks of wood in the shape of a calf. He piled on other humiliating decrees, culminating in the order that they accept Islam or leave his dominions. The erratic caliph ultimately relaxed his persecution of non-Muslims and even returned much of the property he had seized from the church. A partial cause of al-Hakim's changed attitude was probably his increasingly tenuous connection to Islamic orthodoxy. In 1021, he disappeared under mysterious circumstances. Some of his followers proclaimed him divine and founded a sect based on this mystery and other esoteric teachings of a Muslim cleric, Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Darazi, after whom the Druze sect is named. Thanks to al-Hakim's change of policy, which continued after his death, the Byzantines were allowed to rebuild the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in 1027. Nevertheless, Christians were in a precarious position, and pilgrims remained under threat. In 1056, the Muslims expelled 300 Christians from Jerusalem and forbade European Christians from entering the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. When the fierce and fanatical Seljuk Turks swept down from Central Asia, they enforced a new Islamic rigor, making life increasingly difficult for both native Christians and pilgrims, whose pilgrimages they blocked. After they crushed the Byzantines at Manzikert in 1071 and took the Byzantine emperor Romanus IV Diogenes prisoner, all of Asia Minor was open to them, and their advance was virtually unstoppable. In 1076, they conquered Syria. In 1077, Jerusalem. The Seljuk emir, Atsiz bin Uwak, promised not to harm the inhabitants of Jerusalem. But once his men had entered the city, they murdered 3,000 people. The Seljuks established the Sultanate of Rum, Rome, referring to the New Rome, Constantinople, in Nicaea that same year, perilously close to Constantinople itself. From there, they continued to threaten the Byzantines and harass the Christians all over their new domains. 
The Christian empire of Byzantium, which before Islam's wars of conquest had ruled over a vast expanse, including southern Italy, North Africa, the Middle East, and Arabia, was reduced to little more than Greece. It looked as if its death at the hands of the Seljuks was imminent. The Church of Constantinople considered the popes schismatic and had squabbled with them for centuries. But the new emperor, Alexius I Comnenus, 1081 to 1118, swallowed his pride and appealed for help. And that is how the First Crusade came about. It was a response to the Byzantine emperor's call for help. PC Myth The Crusades were an early example of the West's predatory imperialism. Predatory imperialism? Hardly. Pope Urban II, who called for the First Crusade at the Council of Clermont in 1095, was calling for a defensive action, one that was long overdue. As he explained, he was calling for the Crusade because without any defensive action, the faithful of God will be much more widely attacked by the Turks and other Muslim forces. After admonishing his flock to keep peace among themselves, he turned their attention to the East. For your brethren who live in the East are in urgent need of your help, and you must hasten to give them the aid which has often been promised them. For, as the most of you have heard, the Turks and Arabs have attacked them, and have conquered the territory of Romania, the Greek Empire, as far west as the shore of the Mediterranean and the Hellespont, which is called the Arm of St. George. They have occupied more and more of the lands of those Christians, and have overcome them in seven battles. They have killed and captured many, and have destroyed the churches and devastated the empire. If you permit them to continue thus for a while with impunity, the faithful of God will be much more widely attacked by them. On this account I, or rather the Lord, beseech you as Christ's heralds to publish this everywhere, and to persuade all people of whatever rank, foot soldiers and knights, poor and rich, to carry aid promptly to those Christians, and to destroy that vile race from the lands of our friends. Moreover, Christ commands it. Note that the Pope says nothing about conversion or conquest. A call to destroy that vile race from the lands of our friends falls harshly on modern ears. However, it was not an exhortation for mass extermination, but one to remove Islamic rule from lands that had been Christian. Another summary of the Pope's speech at Claremont reports that Urban spoke of an imminent peril threatening you and all the faithful which has brought us hither. From the confines of Jerusalem and from the city of Constantinople, a grievous report has gone forth and has repeatedly been brought to our ears, namely that a race from the kingdom of the Persians, an accursed race, a race wholly alienated from God, a generation that set not their heart aright, and whose spirit was not steadfast with God, violently invaded the lands of those Christians, and has depopulated them by pillage and fire. They have led away a part of the captives into their own country, and a part they have killed by cruel tortures. They have either destroyed the churches of God, or appropriated them for the rites of their own religion. They destroy the altars, after having defiled them with their uncleanness. The kingdom of the Greeks is now dismembered by them, and has been deprived of territory so vast in extent that it could be traversed in two months' time. This royal city, however, situated at the center of the earth, is now held captive by the enemies of Christ, and is subjected by those who do not know God to the worship of the heathen. She seeks, therefore, and desires to be liberated, and ceases not to implore you to come to her aid." From you especially, she asks succor, because, as we have already said, God has conferred upon you, above all other nations, great glory in arms. The Pope's call invoked the Muslim destruction of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Let the Holy Sepulchre of our Lord and Savior, which is possessed by unclean nations, especially arouse you and the holy places which are now treated with ignominy, and irreverently polluted with the filth of the unclean. The Crusades came together as pilgrimages. Christians from Europe made their way to the Holy Land for religious purposes, with the intention to defend themselves if their way was blocked and they were attacked. Many took religious vows. 
Particularly at the outset, many soldiers left for the Holy Land, and most of the participants in this people's crusade were unceremoniously massacred by the Turks in Western Asia Minor in August 1096. Just like today, Defenders of Islam In Islamic law, jihad is obligatory whenever a Muslim territory is attacked. When non-Muslims invade a Muslim country or near to one, jihad is personally obligatory upon the inhabitants of that country, who must repel the non-Muslims with whatever they can. The call to jihad has occurred throughout the history of Islam. When the Hamdanid ruler Saif al-Dallah waged annual jihad campaigns against the Byzantines in the mid-10th century, Muslims came from far and wide to participate. They came because, in their view, the Byzantines were waging aggressive wars to seize Muslim lands. Later, during the First Crusade, a poet exhorted Muslims to respond, Do you not owe an obligation to God and Islam, defending thereby young men and old? Respond to God. Woe to you. Respond. The venerable Islamic jurist, most beloved of today's jihadists, Ibn Tamiya Taqi al-Din Ahmad Ibn Tamiya, 1263-1328, considered jihad an absolute. If the enemy wants to attack the Muslims, then repelling him becomes a duty for all those under attack, and for the others, in order to help them. Some other examples of calls to jihad during the last hundred years. In 1914, the Ottoman caliph Sultan Mehmet V issued a fatwa, a religious ruling, calling for jihad at the outbreak of World War I. In 2003, a Chechen jihadist group announced, when the enemy entered a territory, a city, or a village where Muslims are living, then everybody is obligated to go to war. In 2003, the Islamic Center for Research at Al-Azhar University in Cairo issued a declaration. It is in accordance with logic and with Islamic religious law that if the enemy raids the land of the Muslims, jihad becomes an individual's commandment, applying to every Muslim man and woman, because our Muslim nation will be subject to a new crusader invasion targeting the land, honor, belief, and homeland. And when Sheikh Omar Bakri Muhammad, the notorious London-based jihadist imam, said in late 2002, when the enemy enters Muslim land, such as Palestine, Chechnya, Kosovo, or Kashmir, all Muslims living within traveling distance of the aggression must fight with all possible support from Muslims worldwide. PC Myth The Crusades were fought by Westerners greedy for gain. Of course, not every crusader's motives were pure. More than once, many fell from the high ideals of Christian pilgrims. But the PC dogma that the crusades were unprovoked imperialist actions against a peaceful indigenous Muslim population is simply historically inaccurate and reflects distaste for Western civilization rather than genuine historical research. Pope Urban didn't envision the crusades as a chance for gain. He decreed that lands recovered from the Muslims would belong to Alexius Comnenus and the Byzantine Empire. The Pope saw the Crusades as an act of sacrifice rather than profit. Crusading was, in fact, prohibitively expensive. Crusaders sold their property to raise money for their long journey to the Holy Land, and did so knowing they might not return. A typical example of a Crusader was Godfrey of Bouillon, the Duke of Lower Lorraine, and one of the more prominent European lords who took the cross as joining the crusade was known. He sold off many properties in order to finance his trip, but he clearly planned to come home rather than settle in the Middle East, because he did not give up his title or all his holdings. Recent studies of crusaders' documents reveal that the vast majority of them were not second sons looking for a prophet and estates in the Middle East. Most were, like Godfrey, lords of their own estates, men with a great deal to lose. Certainly some crusaders did very well for themselves after the First Crusade. Fulche of Chartres writes, Those who were poor there, here God makes rich.
Those who had few coins here possess countless besants, and those who had not a villa here by the gift of God already possess a city. But most who did return to Europe came back with nothing material to show for their efforts. Just like today, jihadists from all over. As they have done throughout history, Muslim warriors travel long distances in order to participate in the latest jihads. In the 1990s, the Balkans became a favored destination for veterans of the jihad wars in Afghanistan and Chechnya. A prominent jihad commander in Bosnia, Abu Abdel Aziz, explained that he went there after meeting with several Islamic authorities in Saudi Arabia. They all support, he said, the religious dictum that the fighting in Bosnia is a fight to make the word of Allah supreme and protect the chastity of Muslims. It is because Allah said in his holy book, Yet, if they ask you for succor against religious persecution, it is your duty to give them this succor. Literally, to succor them in religion. Quran, Al-Anfal, Surah 8, verse 72. It is then our religious duty to defend our Muslim brethren wherever they are, as long as they are persecuted because they are Muslims and not for any other reason. Before, during, and after the 2003 war in Iraq, jihadists streamed into that country from all over the world, including some unexpected places. A German security official noted in late 2003 that since the end of the war, there has been a large movement of people motivated by Islamic extremism from Germany and the rest of Europe toward Iraq. PC Myth the Crusades were fought to convert Muslims to Christianity by force. To hear some PC types tell it, the Crusaders swept into the Middle East, swords in hand, and set about killing every infidel they saw, except those they forced to convert to Christianity. But this is lurid, politically motivated fantasy. Glaringly absent from every report about Pope Urban's address at the Council of Claremont is any command to convert Muslims. The Pope's only preoccupation is to defend Christian pilgrims and recapture Christian lands. It was not until over a hundred years after the First Crusade, in the 13th century, that European Christians made any organized attempt to convert Muslims to Christianity when the Franciscans began missionary work among Muslims in lands held by the Crusaders. This effort was largely unsuccessful. When the Crusaders were victorious and established kingdoms and principalities in the Middle East, they generally let the Muslims in their domains live in peace, practice their religion freely, build new mosques and schools, and maintain their own religious tribunals. Some have compared their status to that of the dhimmis in Muslim lands. They retained a certain measure of autonomy, but were subject to unfavorable taxation rates and other restrictions. It is likely that the Crusaders adopted some of the dhimmi laws already in place, but they did not subject Jews or Muslims to dress codes, so Jews and Muslims could avoid day-to-day -day discrimination and harassment. This was the opposite of Muslim practice. The key difference is that the Dima was never part of Christian doctrine and law, as it has been and remains part of Islam. What's more, the Spanish Muslim Ibn Jubayr, 1145-1217, who traversed the Mediterranean on his way to Mecca in the early 1180s, found that Muslims had it better in the lands controlled by the Crusaders than they did in Islamic lands. Those lands were more orderly and better managed than those under Muslim rule, so that even Muslims preferred to live in the Crusader realms. Upon leaving Tibnin, near Tyre, we passed through an unbroken skein of farms and villages whose lands were efficiently cultivated. The inhabitants were all Muslims, but they live in comfort with the Frange, Franks, or Crusaders. May God preserve them from temptation. Their dwellings belong to them, and all their property is unmolested. All the regions controlled by the Frange in Syria are subject to this same system. The landed domains, villages, and farms have remained in the hands of the Muslims.
Now doubt invests the heart of a great number of these men when they compare their lot to that of their brothers living in Muslim territory. Indeed, the latter suffer from the injustice of their co-religionists, whereas the Frange act with equity. So much for the contention that the Crusaders were barbarians attacking a far superior and more advanced civilization. A Book You're Not Supposed to Read The New Concise History of the Crusades by Thomas F. Madden, Lanham, Maryland, Roman and Littlefield, 2005, is a briskly told page-turner that dispels innumerable PC myths about why the Crusades were fought, who fought them, and what happened during each one. This book is continued on Disc 5. The Politically Incorrect Guide to Islam and the Crusades by Robert Spencer Continued, Disc 5 Chapter 11 The Crusades, Myth and Reality Guess what? The Crusades were not early manifestations of European colonialism in the Middle East. The Crusader massacre of Jews and Muslims in Jerusalem in 1099 was a terrible atrocity, but it was nothing unusual according to the rules of warfare of the time. The Crusades were not called in order to target Jews as well as Muslims. It is often said the Crusaders marched across Europe to the Middle East. Once there, they pillaged and murdered Muslim and Jewish men, women, and children indiscriminately, and forced the survivors to convert to Christianity. Awash in pools of blood, they established European proto-colonies in the Levant, inspiring and setting a pattern for legions of later colonialists. They were the setting for the world's first mass killings, and are a blot on the history of the Catholic Church, Europe, and Western civilization. So horrifying were they that Pope John Paul II ultimately apologized to the Islamic world for the Crusades. Any truth? No. Virtually every assertion in this paraphrase, though routinely made by numerous experts, is wrong. PC Myth The Crusaders Established European Colonies in the Middle East as the Crusaders made their way east in response to Pope Urban's call, their principal leaders met with Byzantine Emperor Alexius Comnenus. He prevailed upon them to agree individually, in accord with Urban's wishes, that any lands they conquered would revert to the Byzantine Empire. The Crusaders changed their minds about this after the Siege of Antioch in 1098. As the siege dragged on through the winter and Muslim armies advanced north from Jerusalem, the Crusaders waited for the Byzantine emperor to arrive with troops. But the emperor had received a report that the Crusaders' situation in Antioch was hopeless and turned back his forces. The Crusaders felt betrayed and became enraged. After they overcame immense odds and took Antioch, they renounced their agreements with Alexius and began to establish their own governments. These were not, however, colonial arrangements. The Crusader states simply would not have been recognizable as colonies to someone familiar with Virginia, Australia, or the Dutch East Indies in later centuries. Broadly, a colony is a land that is ruled by a far-off power. But the Crusader states were not ruled from Western Europe. The governments they established did not answer to any Western power. Nor did the Crusader rulers siphon off the wealth of their lands and send it back to Europe. They had no economic arrangements with any European country. The Crusaders established their states in order to provide permanent protection for Christians in the Holy Land. In fact, many Crusaders ceased to think of themselves as Europeans. The chronicler Fulche of Chartres wrote, Consider, I pray, and reflect how in our time God has transferred the West into the East. For we who were Occidentals now have been made Orientals. He who was a Roman or a Frank is now a Galilean or an inhabitant of Palestine. One who was a citizen of Reims or Chartres now has been made a citizen of Tyre or of Antioch. We have already forgotten the places of our birth. 
Already they have become unknown to many of us, or at least are unmentioned. Some already possess here homes and servants which they have received through inheritance. Some have taken wives not merely of their own people, but Syrians or Armenians, or even Saracens, who have received the grace of baptism. Some have with them father-in-law, or daughter-in-law, or son-in-law, or stepson, or stepfather. There are here, too, grandchildren and great-grandchildren. One cultivates vines, another the fields. The one and the other use mutually the speech and the idioms of the different languages. Different languages, now made common, become known to both races, and faith unites those whose forefathers were strangers. As it is written, the lion and the ox shall eat straw together. Those who were strangers are now natives, and he who was a sojourner now has become a resident. At the same time, another feature of colonialism, large-scale emigration from the home country, did not materialize. No streams of settlers came from Europe to settle in the Crusader states. PC Myth the capture of Jerusalem was unique in medieval history, and caused Muslim mistrust of the West. After a five-week siege, the Crusaders entered Jerusalem on July 15, 1099. An anonymous contemporary account by a Christian has seared what happened next into the memory of the world. One of our knights, Letholdus by name, climbed onto the wall of the city. When he reached the top, all the defenders of the city quickly fled along the walls and through the city. Our men followed and pursued them, killing and hacking, as far as the Temple of Solomon, and there was such a slaughter that our men were up to their ankles in the enemy's blood. The emir who commanded the Tower of David surrendered to the Count of St. Gilles, and opened the gate where pilgrims used to pay tribute. Entering the city, our pilgrims pursued and killed the Saracens up to the Temple of Solomon. There the Saracens assembled and resisted fiercely all day, so that the whole temple flowed with their blood. At last the pagans were overcome, and our men seized many men and women in the temple, killing them or keeping them alive as they saw fit. On the roof of the temple there was a great crowd of pagans of both sexes, to whom Tancred and Gaston de Bert gave their banners to provide them with protection. Then the crusaders scattered throughout the city, seizing gold and silver, horses and mules, and houses full of all sorts of goods. Afterwards our men went rejoicing and weeping for joy to adore the sepulcher of our Savior Jesus, and there discharged their debt to him." It is jarring to our modern sensibilities to read a positive account of such a wanton massacre. Such is the difference between the attitudes and assumptions of those days and our own. Similarly, three principal crusade leaders, Archbishop d'Ambert, Godfrey, Duke of Bouillon, and Raymond, Count of Toulouse, boasted to Pope Paschal II in September 1099 about the crusaders' Jerusalem exploits. And if you desire to know what was done with the enemy who were found there, know that in Solomon's porch and in his temple our men rode in the blood of the Saracens up to the knees of their horses. Significantly, Godfrey himself, one of the most respected crusade leaders, did not participate in the slaughter. Perhaps he was more aware than the rank-and-file soldiers of what a betrayal this behavior represented to the crusaders' principles. Balderic a bishop and author of an early 12th century history of Jerusalem, reports that the crusaders killed between twenty and thirty thousand people in the city. That is likely exaggerated, but Muslim sources put the number even higher. Although the earliest Muslim sources do not specify a death count, Ibn al-Jazi, writing about a hundred years after the event, says that the crusaders killed more than seventy thousand Muslims in Jerusalem. Ibn al-Athir, a contemporary of Saladin, the Muslim leader who gained impressive victories over the Crusaders late in the 12th century, offers the same number. The 15th century historian Ibn Taghrabirdi records 100,000. So the story of this massacre has grown over the centuries.
to the point where a former president of the United States, Bill Clinton, recounted at a leading Catholic university, Georgetown, in November 2001, that the Crusaders murdered not just every Muslim warrior or even every Muslim male, but every woman and child who was Muslim on the Temple Mound until the blood was running not just up to their ankles, as the Christian chronicler had it, but as D'Ambert, Godfrey, and Raymond have boasted, up to their knees. This atrocity, this outrage, was, we have been told time and again, the starting point of a millennial hostility between Islam and the West, It might be more accurate to say that it was the start of a millennium of anti-Western grievance-mongering and propaganda. The Crusaders' sack of Jerusalem was a heinous crime, particularly in light of the religious and moral principles they professed to uphold. However, by the military standards of the day, it was not out of the ordinary. In those days, it was a generally accepted principle of warfare that if a city under siege resisted capture, it could be sacked and if it did not resist, mercy would be shown. Some accounts say that the Crusaders promised the inhabitants of Jerusalem that they would be spared, but reneged on this promise. Others tell us that they did allow many Jews and Muslims to leave the city in safety. Count Raymond gave a personal guarantee of safety to the Fatimid governor of Jerusalem, Iftikhar al Dawla. In the mind of a crusader, when such guarantees were issued, those who remained in the city would have been more likely to be identified with the resistance, and their lives forfeited. And what about those ankle- or knee-deep rivers of blood? This was a rhetorical flourish. When the Christian chronicler and crusade leaders boasted of this, everyone would have considered it an embellishment. In fact, such rivers were not even remotely possible. There weren't enough people in Jerusalem to bleed that much, even if its population had swelled with refugees from the surrounding regions. The fact that the sack of Jerusalem was not out of the ordinary probably accounts for the laconic nature of the earliest Muslim accounts of the incident. Around 1160, two Syrian chroniclers, al-Azimi and Ibn al kalanisi wrote separately of the sack. Neither one offered an estimate of the numbers killed. Al-Azimi said only that the Crusaders turned to Jerusalem and conquered it from the hands of the Egyptians. Godfrey took it. They burned the Church of the Jews. Ibn al kalanisi added a bit more detail. The Franks stormed the town and gained possession of it. A number of the townsfolk fled to the sanctuary, and a great host were killed. The Jews assembled in the synagogue, and the Franks burned it over their heads. The sanctuary was surrendered to them on guarantee of safety on 22 Shaban, July 14th of this year, and they destroyed the shrines and the tomb of Abraham. It wasn't until later that Muslim writers realized the propaganda value of stressing and inflating the death tolls. In any event, it is a matter of record that Muslim armies frequently behaved in exactly the same way when entering a conquered city. This is not to excuse the Crusaders' conduct by pointing to similar incidents and suggesting that everybody does it, as Islamic apologists frequently do today when confronted with the realities of modern jihad terrorism. One atrocity does not excuse another. But it does illustrate that the Crusaders' behavior in Jerusalem was consistent with that of other armies of the period, since all states subscribe to the same notions of siege and resistance. Indeed, in 1148, Muslim commander Nur ed-Din did not hesitate to order the killing of every Christian in Aleppo. In 1268, when the jihad forces of the Mamluk sultan Baybars took Antioch from the Crusaders, Baybars was annoyed to find that the Crusader ruler, Count Bohemond VI, had already left the city. He wrote to Bohemond to make sure he knew what his men had done in Antioch. You would have seen your knights prostrate beneath the horses' hooves, your houses stormed by pillagers and ransacked by looters, your wealth weighed by the quintal, your women sold four at a time and bought for a dinar of your own money. You would have seen the crosses in your churches smashed, the pages of the false testaments scattered, the patriarch's tombs overturned. You would have seen your Muslim enemy trampling on the place where you celebrate the Mass, cutting the throats of monks, priests, and deacons upon the altars, 
bringing sudden death to the patriarchs and slavery to the royal princes. You would have seen fire running through your palaces, your dead burned in this world before going down to the fires of the next, your palace lying unrecognizable, the church of St. Paul and that of the cathedral of St. Peter pulled down and destroyed. Then you would have said, Would that I were dust, and that no letter had ever brought me such tidings. Most notorious of all may be the jihadists' entry into Constantinople on May 29, 1453, when they, like the crusaders in Jerusalem in 1099, finally broke through a prolonged resistance to their siege. Here the rivers of blood ran again, as historian Stephen Runciman notes. The Muslim soldiers slew everyone that they met in the streets, men, women, and children without discrimination. The blood ran in rivers down the steep streets from the heights of Petra toward the Golden Horn. But soon the lust for slaughter was assuaged. The soldiers realized that captives and precious objects would bring them greater profit. Like crusaders who violated the sanctuary of both synagogue and mosque, Muslims raided monasteries and convents, emptying them of their inhabitants, and plundered private homes. They entered the Hagia Sophia, which for nearly a thousand years had been the grandest church in Christendom. The faithful had gathered within its hallowed walls to pray during the city's last agony. The Muslims halted the celebration of Orthros, morning prayer, while the priests, according to legend, took the sacred vessels and disappeared into the cathedral's eastern wall, through which they shall return to complete the divine service one day. Muslim men then killed the elderly and weak, and led the rest off into slavery. When the slaughter and pillaging was finished, the Ottoman Sultan Mehmet II ordered an Islamic scholar to mount the high pulpit of the Hagia Sophia and declare that there was no god but Allah, and Muhammad was his prophet. The magnificent old church was turned into a mosque. Hundreds of other churches in Constantinople and elsewhere suffered the same fate. Millions of Christians joined the wretched ranks of the dhimmis. Others were enslaved, and many martyred. PC Myth The Muslim leader Saladin was more merciful and magnanimous than the Crusaders. One of the most famous figures of the Crusades is the Muslim warrior Saladin, who reunited much of the Islamic world and inflicted great damage on the Crusaders. In our age, Saladin has become the prototype of the tolerant, magnanimous Muslim warrior, historical proof of the nobility of Islam, and even of its superiority to wicked Western colonialist Christianity. In The Crusades Through Arab Eyes, Amin Malouf portrays the Crusaders as little more than savages, even gorging themselves on the flesh of those they have murdered. But Saladin... He was always affable with visitors, insisting that they stay to eat, treating them with full honors even if they were infidels, and satisfying all their requests. He could not bear to let someone who had come to him depart disappointed, and there were those who did not hesitate to take advantage of this quality. One day, during a truce with the Frange, Franks, the Brins, lord of Antioch, arrived unexpectedly at Saladin's tent, and asked him to return a district that the sultan had taken four years earlier, and he agreed. The lovable lug, if asked, he might have given away the entire Holy Land. In one sense it's true. Saladin set out to conquer Jerusalem in 1187 because crusaders under the command of Reynald of Châtillon were taking a page from the prophet Muhammad's book and raiding caravans, in this case, Muslim caravans. The Christian rulers of Jerusalem ordered Reynald to stop because they knew that his actions endangered the very survival of their kingdom. Yet he persisted. Finally, Saladin, who had been looking for a reason to go to war with the Christians, found one in Reynald's raids. A lot is made of the fact that when Saladin recaptured Jerusalem for the Muslims in October 1187, he treated the Christians with magnanimity, in sharp contrast to the behavior of the Crusaders in 1099. However, the real Saladin was not the proto-multiculturalist early version of Nelson Mandela that he is made out to be today. 
When his forces decisively defeated the Crusaders at Hattin on July 4, 1187, he ordered the mass execution of his Christian opponents. According to his secretary, Imad ed-Din, Saladin ordered that they should be beheaded in accordance with Quran, Surah 47, verse 4. When you meet the unbelievers on the battlefield, strike their necks, choosing to have them dead rather than in prison. With him was a whole band of scholars and Sufis and a certain number of devout men and ascetics. Each begged to be allowed to kill one of them and drew his sword and rolled back his sleeve. Saladin, his face joyful, was sitting on his dais. The unbelievers showed black despair. Also, when Saladin and his men entered Jerusalem later that year, their magnanimity was actually pragmatism. He had initially planned to put all the Christians in the city to death. However, when the Christian commander inside Jerusalem, Balian of Ibelin, threatened in turn to destroy the city and kill all the Muslims there before Saladin could get inside, Saladin relented. Although once inside the city, he did enslave many of the Christians who could not afford to buy their way out. Just like today, the moral double standard. Bill Clinton suggested that the sack of Jerusalem in 1099 was the ultimate cause of the September 11th attacks. Yet the Muslims' sack of Constantinople in 1453 does not burn in anyone's memory. No president has pointed to it as the root cause of any modern-day terrorist acts. Indeed, it is less well-known today than another sack of Constantinople, the one perpetrated by misguided crusaders in 1204. This is one illustration of the strange, unacknowledged moral double standard that PC types use when evaluating behavior by Westerners and non-Westerners. Any number of massacres and atrocities can be forgiven non-Western, non-white, non-Christian people. But misdeeds by Christian, or even post-Christian Westerners, remain seared in the world's collective memory. The Abu Ghraib prison scandals received horrified attention worldwide in 2004 and 2005, often from the same people who glossed over or ignored worse evils of Saddam Hussein, Osama bin Laden, and Hamas. It's a tacit admission of a fact that the PC establishment stoutly denies in every other case. Christianity does teach a higher moral standard than Islam, and more is expected not only of observant Christians, but of those who have imbibed these high principles by living in the societies molded by them. PC Myth Crusades were called against Jews in addition to Muslims. It is unfortunately true that crusaders targeted Jews on several occasions. Some groups of crusaders allowed themselves to be diverted from the mission Pope Urban had given them. Stirred up by anti-Semitic preachers, one contingent of men who were making their way east for the First Crusade instead turned to terrorize Jews in Europe, massacring many. Count Emiko of Leiningen and his followers advanced through the Rhineland, killing and plundering Jews in five German cities, Speyer, Worms, Mainz, Trier, and Cologne. Some of the bishops in those areas tried to prevent these massacres, and eventually Count Emiko and his followers met their end when he tried to extend his pogrom into Hungary. However, the damage was done, News of his exploits spread to the Middle East and led many Jews to ally with the Muslims and fight against the Crusaders when they arrived. Fifty years later, another group in the Rhineland, bound for the Second Crusade, began massacring Jews again. All this was inexcusable, as well as being an incalculable error of judgment. The Crusaders would have been much wiser to see the Jews, fellow dhimmis, as their natural allies in the resistance to the Islamic Jihad. The Muslims treated Jews and Christians more or less the same way, badly. It is unfortunate that neither group ever saw the other as a companion in the sufferings of dimitude, and a fellow fighter against its oppressions. However, even today, eight centuries after the last Crusade, that kind of thinking is rare so it is perhaps unfair to expect it of the Crusaders. 
In any case, was the mistreatment of Jews a fundamental feature of the Crusades in general? Not according to the historical record. Pope Urban's call for the First Crusade at the Council of Clermont says nothing about Jews, and churchmen were Emico's most formidable opponents. In fact, Urban himself condemned Emico's attacks. Bernard of Clairvaux, one of the chief organizers of the Second Crusade, went to the Rhineland and personally stopped the persecution of the Jews, declaring, Ask anyone who knows the sacred scriptures what he finds foretold of the Jews in the psalm. Not for their destruction do I pray, it says. Popes and bishops repeatedly called for the mistreatment of the Jews to end. Yet even after the sack of Jerusalem and massacre of the Jews, during the Crusader period, Jews in the Middle East generally preferred to live in areas controlled by the Franks despite the undeniable hostility the Christians from Europe had for them. They knew all too well that what was in store for them in Muslim lands was even worse. Muhammad versus Jesus Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you salute only your brethren, what more are you doing than others? Jesus. Matthew chapter 5, verse 7, and verses 46 through 47. Muhammad is Allah's apostle. Those who follow him are ruthless to the unbelievers, but merciful to one another. Quran. Surah 48, verse 29. PC Myth. The Crusades were bloodier than the Islamic Jihads. The Crusaders massacred in Jerusalem. Saladin and his Muslim troops didn't. This has become emblematic of conventional wisdom regarding the Crusades. Yes, the Muslims conquered, but the inhabitants of the lands they seized welcomed their conquest. They were just and magnanimous toward religious minorities in those lands. The Crusaders, by contrast, were bloody, rapacious, and merciless. We have shown this conventional wisdom to be completely false. Saladin only refrained from massacring the inhabitants of Jerusalem for pragmatic reasons, and Muslim conquerors easily matched and exceeded the cruelty of the Crusaders in Jerusalem on many occasions. The Muslim conquerors were not welcomed, but were tenaciously resisted, and met resistance with extreme brutality. Once in power, they instituted severe repressive measures against religious minorities. A Book You're Not Supposed to Read The Crusades, The World's Debate, by Hilaire Belloc, 1937, republished by Tan Books, 1992. Belloc presents an arresting prophecy. In the major thing of all, religion, we have fallen back, and Islam has in the main preserved its soul. We are divided in the face of a Mohammedan world, divided in every way, divided by separate independent national rivalries, by the warring interests of possessions and dispossessed, and that division cannot be remedied because the cement which once held our civilization together, the Christian cement, has crumbled. Perhaps before these lines appear in print, the rapidly developing situation in the Near East will have marked some notable change. Perhaps that change will be deferred, but change there will be, continuous and great. Nor does it seem probable that at the end of such a change, especially if the process be prolonged, Islam will be the loser. Did the Pope apologize for the Crusades? All right, you may say, but despite everything you're saying, the Crusades are still a blot on the record of Western civilization. After all, even Pope John Paul II apologized for them. Why would he have done that if they weren't regarded negatively today? There is no doubt that the belief that Pope John Paul II apologized for the Crusades is widespread. When he died, the Washington Post reminded its readers, during his long reign, Pope John Paul II apologized to Muslims for the Crusades, to Jews for anti-Semitism, to Orthodox Christians for the sacking of Constantinople, to Italians for the Vatican's associations with the Mafia, 
and to scientists for the persecution of Galileo. A broad list, but John Paul II never apologized for the Crusades. The closest he came was on March 12, 2000, the Day of Pardon. During his homily, he said, We cannot fail to recognize the infidelities to the gospel committed by some of our brethren, especially during the second millennium. Let us ask pardon for the divisions which have occurred among Christians, for the violence some have used in the service of the truth, and for the distrustful and hostile attitudes sometimes taken towards the followers of other religions. This is hardly a clear apology for the Crusades. Anyway, given the true history of the Crusades, such an apology would not have been warranted. The Crusaders do not deserve the opprobrium of the world, but, as we shall see, the world's gratitude.